Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up in today's show, director Ashgar Farhadi joins us to talk about life and cinema in the Islamic Republic. The man who made Iran's first Oscar-winning film is back with a new release. He's among the most intriguing artists of the 20th century. Expressionist painter Bernard Buffet's work comes to light at the Modern Art Museum here in Paris. And we wish French pop rock publishing institution Les Arocs a happy birthday as the magazine turns 30. He won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film in 2012, and he could be in the running for another gold statuette. Ashka Fahadi is among the few Iranian filmmakers free to work in the country today, and his films are just as popular at home as abroad. After the critical success of A Separation, he returns with another domestic drama, The Salesman, which won two prizes at the Cannes Film Festival this year. François Katz, Louise Dupont sat down with him to find out more. من و خانمم که از اینجا اصول کشی کردیم رفتیم توی خونه ای که حالا اینجا از که شما سوالیم بالاخره Bonjour, Asghar Faradi. Bonjour. Thanks for being with us. When you received the award for Best Screenplay at Cannes Film Festival, you said you wanted to bring joy to the Iranian people. Can you explain why? What did you mean by that? It was a spontaneous reaction. I wasn't expecting to win the prize or give a speech that night. And those words came to my mind. My films aren't considered joyful, but I noticed, and I'm pleased by the fact that when I win an award and return home to Iran, people, well, at least some people, are very happy, and I'm so pleased to give them that pleasure. The salesman tells the story of a couple, an actor and an actress, whose lives sharply decline. The husband is traumatized when his wife is assaulted. His search for revenge becomes an obsession. Tradition and honor are at the heart of the film. Can you tell us about the values and morals in Iranian society? I don't see the film that way. It's not an encyclopedia of life in Iran. It's a film about human beings. Their story could have happened anywhere else in the world. A Cuban could watch the movie without knowing where it comes from and relate to it. Iranian directors don't create showcases of Iranian society. Their work is not about geography, but people. That doesn't mean that there aren't some specifically Iranian traits. If the movie is realistic, the story is told in a social and cultural reality specific to the country where it's set. But the same story could happen elsewhere. It's also important to stress that when a film tells a story specific to one group of individuals or a family, their actions cannot be generalized to a whole society. We're talking about a country with 70 million inhabitants, with different lifestyles, religions, habits. No film can represent the Iranian man, the Iranian woman, or the Iranian way of being. Once again, one of your movies, The Salesman, has been chosen to represent Iran in the best foreign film category in the next Oscars. Some critics say that's a sign that you bend and adapt a bit too much to the Islamic Republic's demands, so you can continue filming in Iran and elsewhere. What would you say to those critics? I think that people who say that don't genuinely know the situation in Iran. For example, the committee that selects films for international competitions is not related to authorities. It's a group of nine people, movie makers and critics. 
Sharam Mokri, a renowned director whose latest film was presented in Venice, is in the committee. It's by these professionals that my movie was selected. On top of that, authorities are absolutely not easy on me. Anyone living in Iran would say that comment is ridiculous. What's interesting is that this approach is similar to the one fundamentalists have. They say Faradi makes movies to please foreign powers. But my movies are watched in Iran more than anywhere else. For me, these accusations all come from the same kind of narrow-minded people. On one side, they say that if my films are authorized, it means I work for the Iranian authorities. On the other side, they say I work for the West and not my country. I think both critics are extremists and they're very much alike. Bernard Buffet was once hailed as the artistic successor to Picasso, but many of his paintings haven't seen the light of day for more than 50 years. Now Paris's Modern Art Museum is showing the works of one of the most respected painters of the 20th century, but he's also one of the most contentious. Sanam Chantier has more. Picasso's Cubist paintings are recognized by most. But who remembers the work of this artist, who was once dubbed one of France's fabulous five? His first retrospective was in the Jet Set 50s before he'd even reached 30. Within 10 years, Bernard Buffet was one of the most celebrated artists of his time. A period that Pierre Berger, his living partner for a while, remembers all too well. I immediately picked up on the fact that he was an extraordinary being who lived to be creative and that he would, without a doubt, become a great painter. But Buffet's at times garish colors and bold lines were shunned by his critics. And so he drowned himself in his work and alcohol. Late in life, the Frenchman was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which eventually robbed him of his ability to work. At 71, he took his own life. My father always said, the day I can't work anymore is the day I kill myself. It's only after a lifetime of rejection that Buffet is finally being remembered at this exhibition. And that's thanks to his son. He wasn't well known in France. While his critics here were lashing out, he had a phenomenal success, an extraordinary career abroad. He had exhibitions in some of the greatest galleries in the world. Bernard Buffet has left behind as many as 7,000 paintings, most of which are stored away. But they deserve to find their place on museum walls. It's the French equivalent of Rolling Stone magazine. Les Inrocuptibles is considered a reference in the industry and a must-read for music fans. The weekly publication, commonly known as Les Inroc, takes in society, culture and politics. Now it's celebrating 30 years in print. France Van Katz, Marie Schuster went to meet the editorial team on this important milestone. An A-list of recording artists have adorned its covers. 30 years since it was launched, Les Inrocutibles has established itself as a trendsetter in the French music industry. This is the first edition of Les Inrocs. It's 30 years old. Founding editor Jean-Daniel Beauval says the magazine has kept its punk spirit, as well as its obsession with all things cool. We wanted to make a magazine that talked about the bands we liked, but no one cared about. And our strategy seems to have worked. If anyone told us at the time that we would still be around in 30 years, I'm not sure we would have believed it. In any case, it's great that we kept our faith and followed the same principles, which are to discover and share emerging talents, while also covering the giants of the industry like Leonard Cohen. That's our philosophy. 
For up-and-coming artists like Adam Nas, being covered by the magazine is the first step into the mainstream music world. It has a religious following of fans who worship it like the Bible. I remember when the Arouks did a big special edition on folk music. I lapped up every word because I love folk music. It helped me discover absolutely loads of artists, all thanks to this magazine. So one day when I found an article about me inside, I couldn't believe it. It was crazy. I was so happy. You're killing me, you're holding me down. Little talks for the better. Tap, tap on your shoulder. I fell in love, but it's over. I go down, down, down. Now the magazine is trying to promote the 24-year-old. After he entered the Unrock Lab, its own singing contest designed to discover new talents. That competition has given the folk soul singer the right to perform alongside international artists at the renowned Unrock Festival, which starts this week. 30 years on, the magazine's influence today goes beyond the music world. It's been credited with changing France's cultural landscape. We're finishing with a Broadway classic, the musical about musicals, 42nd Street. The Depression-era song and dance extravaganza is now on stage here in Paris at the Châtelet Theatre, and you can take in those toe-tapping numbers until January 8th. Remember to check out our website for more arts and culture, and you can also keep up with Encore on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.